Continuing the same debate with the same objective, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, to understand the place of Africa and how they can take advantage of the geopolitics, which we cannot actually avoid uh, in uh, uh, this globalized world. We now want to analyze uh, the aspect of uh, uh, political stability in Africa and how uh, Africa heavily rely on uh, geopolitical interests of uh, external powers. Uh, let's look at what is happening, uh, taking the perspective of Mr. Elijah, who mentioned that some powers actually come to Africa and create chaos, discord among Africans to actually uh, meet their personal objectives. Now the question that we are uh, looking at this particular moment, because uh, in recent times we've been seeing, you know, debates around the U.S. trying to uh, stop some African leaders from attending the, the just the uh, NDT uh, Russia Africa summit, uh, which actually is an aspect of geopolitics where uh, partners or stakeholders come together to discuss on how they can benefit from each other. And then we see some countries advocating that this uh, particular nations in Africa shouldn't attend or shouldn't engage uh, with uh, this country. Now the question is, should Africa or uh, should African leaders be dictated on how to take such a decision or strategic decisions that have a long way to transform narratives across Africa? And of course, bringing us still to this question of political stability in Africa and how the geopolitical engagement can help in uh, uh, attaining this? The answer to that question is uh, simply, and I love simple answers sometimes when uh, uh, simple questions are thrown at you. It will be a uh, disaster, a tragedy for us to, to applaud African leaders uh, being dictated I think at uh, last week at a show, we uh, pinpointed the fact that, you know, when it comes to the Russia-Africa summit, the U.S.-Africa summit, the France-Africa summit, or even the uh, forum on uh, China and African cooperation, it is the one nation, one country that invites a multitude of African of the states uh, to uh, their place or wherever. Uh, the location is. And of course, the conversation goes this way. I think we took it, and even it is not just the Africans, but in uh, North America, even in France, among uh, the French parliamentarians, for instance, uh, you do have some of the, the uh, MPs that denounced the fact that the uh, French government uh, was uh, uh, actually engaging or interacting with the African leaders in the sense of uh, telling them who to do, uh, what to do, who to meet, who to talk to, who not to talk to. Uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa of, uh, of South Africa here in the United States at one of his meetings with uh, U.S. President Joe Biden uh, did mention the fact that, you know, it is kind of uh, uh, childish uh, for them to uh, be told uh, whether they should uh, interact with uh, Russia or uh, or not. And uh, this pushback from the uh, president of South Africa, one of the uh, largest and biggest and powerful nations we have in, uh, in Africa, was a very uh, uh, significant. We heard the same thing also from the president of Ghana, where during one of his encounters with uh, the president of uh, France, Macron, uh, and then on the many topics, sometimes uh, you do hear those African of states, you know, head of states reacting. So the uh, simple answer to that question, should they be dictated? The answer is again, uh, uh, no, uh, it didn't hear uh, very clearly. And then the other question that you asked, the uh, aspect of, uh, uh, before I get into that, uh, Clarice, you talk about the change of narratives. One of the things that you know what I have heard, and I am happy to be hearing, anytime you have uh, taken the uh, floor to introduce a new uh, question or a situate where we are in the debate, you call Africa a major player in the world geopolitics Thanks, or this uh, global <laughs> world relation uh, that we have today. Uh... Professor Nubong, you want to close your mic, please? 
And uh, so, Clarice, I believe that, you know, were those words that, that you use, calling Africa a uh, major player, I'm not sure that, you know, but we have uh, many, uh, let's say, Africans, uh, stakeholders, uh, members of a parliament, you know, uh, policymakers on the African continent that understand that this dimension of thing. Because geopolitics is also about language. Geopolitics is also about, you know, uh, the words that we use. Why do we call some nations, you know, uh, superpowers? Others, we don't. Why do we call some nations, you know, uh, uh, even when we use the word, you know, we're poor countries or poor indebted, uh, uh, highly indebted countries? All those terminologies form a part of the uh, geopolitical, you know, uh, language or apparatus that we are talking about. When a nation calls another nation a rogue nation, that simple word, rogue being used in here, comes with a lot of connotation. When a nation stands and says, oh, this is our partner or this is our friend and they insist on the long-term relationship that they ever had and the French love to do that. When they talk about, you know, what the multi, according to them, secular relationship that they have with African countries, it means what it means. So geopolitics is also about language and I appreciate the fact that in talking about changing the narrative, you are calling Africa a major player. How many of the people understand that? When it comes to the aspect of a political stability, and uh, how the continent has relied on uh, external powers for a long time. Yes, Clarice, there is also an aspect of uh, geopolitics in there. Why? Brother Elijah, earlier in the show, talked about uh, the dictatorship that have been backed or have been backed by superpowers. I'm trying to reverse the narrative in and here. What was this that, you know, what the uh, African dictators thought they were gaining from receiving or welcoming the backing of these European powers is for them to stay in power very for a long time, number one. Number two, there's another aspect of uh, geopolitics that played on the continent with these detectors. It is uh, the use of one ethnic group against the other or the use of uh, one group against the other. Let's take the particular example of uh, Cameroon. I did engage with some uh, friends you know, uh, and colleagues on that when Describing the uh, uh, political violence in, uh, the, in, uh, in Cameroon, they referred to a group of people as the Anglophone against the Francophone. I took offense at that. Why? Why do we have Anglophone versus Francophone? I caution people. And my submission is we cannot, speaking about new narrative in geopolitics, use those terminologies. I am from the Ivory Coast. My ethnic group is closer to the Akan people I mean, belong to the Akan people in Cote d'Ivoire and closer to the Ashanti people and some groups in Ghana. But yet some Ghanaians will look at me and say the Francophone guy, and I will look at them and say the Anglophone. No. What about our natural or our cultural languages, our native uh, uh, mother tongues that we have that and the cultures that are closer together? So there is no Anglophone. There is no uh, uh, thing. They are Africans. Or at best, there's a Bulu versus another person here. And I want to address uh, very quickly some of the things that I've heard earlier. Uh, that would be my way of uh, a contribution to how the uh, continent can actually take advantage of what is happening uh, currently. That is, we talked about the population. I told you earlier, talking about geopolitics, we have to look at geography. And when we look at geography, we also want to look at uh, human geography. The continent has a population. We are not overpopulated, the continent as still. But if today we have this major competition going on in the world, and as we witness, one of the reasons is the human potential that the continent has. In a few years, 40% of people ages 0 to 25 will be living in Africa. That's a workforce which is currently being depleted either in North America, in the many European countries. When you have a country such as uh, uh, Canada or in Quebec that goes around the world promoting professional, I'll call it quote unquote, professional immigration, looking for people to immigrate to that country with skills to work is because they understand that the number one productive force in an economy is human beings. Artificial intelligence can do whatever they want to do, but still people need to be behind the machines to program them or to make them work. It is people 
But what are we doing with the people, with the workers on the continent? If we wanted to take advantage and benefit from this geopolitical competition, when Chinese signs agreements with the foreign di uh, direct investments and they bring their own workers, what is the impact of that on our African workers and populations? The treaties that they sign, the exploitation, and the companies that establish themselves, how do they treat the African workers? If we talk about economic development, then we want to measure that on how well citizens, workers, families are living better lives. What is the revenue level? Another thing is health. How do we want to take advantage of that, prepare our populations to take advantage of what is going on right now? COVID-19 came, but before COVID-19, we have Ebola. We have many other crises that, you know, what came in in there. But yet, when COVID came, that's when we heard that the African CDC, led by actually one of our Dr. Nkenga Song, I believe, from Cameroon, talking about how now Africa should be at the forefront of producing its own medicine. This is a long shot. This is a way overdue. Because security-wise, we cannot continue to rely on the outside world, either the Western world or India or other partners uh, to supply the essential amount of medicine that we need. It is impossible. So health is another thing. I know that for the West African countries in 2001, all of the members of the ECHO was committed to invest at least 15% of the budgets to improve the health infrastructures in their countries. From 2001 till today, None of those countries have been able to reach that or even to uh, 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 stand to uh, their promises. Mm -hmm. If we do therefore want to take advantage of that, there's another thing we want to look at, security and armies. I usually say that, you know what, no African countries have a good capacity, a, a good fire capacity. How do we therefore compete with the superpowers that not only control the uh, international institutions, the UN, where decisions are being made, how do we explode that to make sure that you know, there is a democratic process in and there when it comes uh, to making decisions uh, that affect how conflicts are resolved uh, in uh, the world? And those conflicts you know, were impacting, therefore, the economy. When we look at what is happening in the Sahel today, Burkina Faso and Mali, we are talking about uh, 2.5 millions of people at least that have been removed from the dwelling places, from their working places. What is the impact of that on the economy? Less of production. It is amazing that today, no matter what we are saying, that African leaders can travel to Russia to claim and to beg for grains to be released when we have on the continent all this vast amount of land that we can take care of and produce and be at least food secure or food sufficient. Last point I want to make on that question. In order for us to claim that, the South-South cooperation, South-South cooperation. India has been the great friends. We all remember in 1955 what happened at the Bandung conference when coming out of a colonization, all of those nations of the world that, that you know, were witnessed, experienced, you know, were European colonization, decided to create what we know as a non-alignment movement. It has evolved up to the group of 1777, uh, and now we talk about, you know, what the South-South, you know, what cooperation in there. Those things need to be reactivated because I believe with that and the help of the BRICS, it can really position the African continent to kind of escape if you want the uh, dictatorship of those international or global institutions that we have today. I am mentioning the UN, I am talking about the IMF, I'm talking about the World Bank, I'm talking about many others, and even the BRICS. My brother Elijah is right. It is not because we say we have the BRICS that you know, automatically it is going to trans uh, 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 translate into Africa harnessing again, and I love this word that people are using, right harnessing the potential of what geopolitics is presenting with us today not only locally regionally but also at the global level we cannot do that if we continue to have a weak currencies or sometimes currencies that are controlled produced 
given to us. Recently, I was in Nigeria. Clarice, don't be mad. I was just next door to you. Uh, next time, well, you know, I will visit, you know, Cameroon. But I was in Nigeria, and some of my colleagues, Professor Elijah, were stunned when I told them that the French CFA is uh, still in, uh, uh, printed in France, and with all of the mechanism that's around that, people can believe we are in 2023. So unless we kind of do, there are many other things that we can talk about, our, the stability of our political institutions, and et cetera, et cetera. But I think these are some of the things that I want to say that uh, Africa needs to be uh, aware of, work on so that you know, we can truly take advantage of these uh, uh, geopolitical changes that you know, what we are seeing uh, in the world today. Very imperative, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, and of course, a great insider on how we can change the narratives. Of course, I always see that Africa is the major player in everything that is happening. Why? Because Africa has the market, Africa has the resources, and Africa has the human capital, a lot that the world needs. And of course, with all of the endowment, what is actually impeding uh, the continent uh, from evolving and of course uh, it is a moment uh, of a wind of change that is growing across Africa and of course uh, with uh, uh, giving African perspectives uh, on a, a debate program like this and others uh, elsewhere it's uh, going to go a long way to change of course the dynamics to change the narratives and uh, before you know it Africa will be taking of course uh, and be very intentional when it comes to making decisions and engaging more uh, with uh, international partners be it across africa and uh, beyond uh, and of course uh, just to remind uh, just who are just tuning in that this is the pan-african debate on african media uh, television and today we are analyzing uh, geopolitics because it is what is actually uh, uh, making headline news across the global world in present society we're looking at how africa being a major player can take advantage of these uh, available uh, uh, opportunities uh, that present uh, themselves as a result of uh, multiple engagements with uh, world pairs or world other nations to actually fast track and meet uh, the developmental agendas of the continent Africa. It's not, of course, like uh, some panelists will always say, it's not in 2063 that the African Union will start looking at how they can actually uh, materialize uh, the agenda, but now the work starts now and take it advantage of what is happening. It's already a milestone towards uh, uh, solving some of the internal problems faced by the continent Africa. So you are what must welcome uh, uh, to the uh, 